My next guest won the Nobel Prize in 2000 for his work on learning and memory, and he really needs no introduction as a neuroscientist. But there is another side to Eric Kandel that you may not know. He is an art collector and historian of early, early 20th century art in Germany and Austria, and he says he could have seen that passion as an alternate career path. Candell's new book, The Age of Insight, The Quest to Understand the Unconscious in Art, Mind, and Brain, takes us back to turn-of-the-century Vienna, the place of his birth, and he writes about the salons there, where artists could mingle with writers and physicians and scientists. Can you think of anywhere that happens today? But this isn't just an art history book. Candell also gets deep into the science of the mind, what happens in the brain when we see a beautiful work of art how it affects our emotions, how we recognize objects and faces, too. It is written by a neuroscientist, after all. Eric Kandel is a senior investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a university professor at Columbia University here in New York. And if I may add a personal note, he is one of the classiest scientists around. Thank you for joining us again, Dr. Kandel. Good to see you. Eric, I, uh, Eric. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me to be here with you. <laughs> Thank you. This book is just terrific. Uh, that's Who very knew kind that you, of you. you had this whole side of you? I didn't realize I had this side of me. <laughs> well, how long have you been collecting art? And, and uh, I've been collecting art for much of my adult life. I started around 1960, um, and my wife and I really enjoy art a great deal. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have a lot of money, so we have works on paper, but we enjoy them a great deal. And I come from Vienna, and I particularly like the period Vienna 1900. Mm. Uh, so this is what my book is about. <laughs> uh, but but best just just take a side trip yes. to about Vienna. We would think that, that that you who escaped Nazi Austria as a child would be so interested in going back and collecting artwork. About it, Vienna. It's a post-traumatic stress disorder, Ira. It's the way I come to grips and try to master uh, some of the painful moments in my life. Mm -hmm. But I do have enormous admiration for Vienna 1900, which is very different than Vienna 1938. It was a time when, as you indicated, uh, there were no two cultures. Uh, people interacted with each other freely. Science was part of the intellectual intercourse of the day. Uh, and Jews and non-Jews acted very productively. It was really a magical period. And my hope and that of others <clears throat> in bridging between art and science is to recreate a period like that. Mm -hmm. um, our president, Lee Bollinger, uh, sees neuroscience as a bridging discipline. He argues that, in a sense, everybody at the university is working on the mind. And insofar as we understand the biology of the mind better, we can have an impact on economics and decision making on art and music on many areas of the university. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you say in your book, uh, you, you talk about unconscious emotions, conscious feelings, bodily expressions, that, that when people see a great piece of artwork, something's going on in their mind. Right. Right. And right. you want to know right. what that is. Exactly. Right. And right. Are we right. any closer to understanding what that is? Uh, we are closer than we were before, but a long way from a really satisfying understanding. As you know, in most areas of science, there are long periods of beginning before we really mm -hmm. make progress. Um, but I think this is a very rich area. And one of the interesting things is, even though you think that um, what uh, Gombridge and Regal called the beholder share, how you and I respond to a work of art, is an extremely difficult problem in brain biology. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is. One can, in principle, outline sort of a set of neural circuits that are critically involved and even identify disorders that affect different components of that mm -hmm. neural circuit and see how what happens if you knock out, for example, you know, inability to recognize faces, how it affects your response to portraiture. Obviously, if you can't see it, your response is going to be very blunted. Or you can interfere with the emotional response to it or the uh, empathic response to it. So different components of it you can really dissect apart. 1-800-989-8255. Mm -hmm. We're talking with Eric Kandel if you'd like to join us and ask him questions uh, about his book. Um, also, you can tweet us at SciFry at S-C-I-F-R-I. Uh, let's get into some of the details on your book because it's quite a fascinating book. 
One of the things you write about is the Zucker. We talked about the salons, the Zucker Candle Salon. I like that. Did I pronounce I, that you correctly? Did it very well. <laughs> I like that for many reasons. First of all, it, it was characteristic of Vienna. It was characteristic of many cities in Europe, in which um, uh, ladies, often Jewish ladies, ran salons that brought together people from all walks of life: uh, artists, writers, scientists business people, politicians, to get together over tea and cakes and talk to one another. Uh, and I particularly like the Zuckerkandl family because uh, Bertha Zuckerkandl, for two reasons, Bertha Zuckerkandl's grandson, Emil Zuckerkandl, is a major biologist at Stanford. And uh, when I began to write about his grandmother, I called him and he gave me a lot of useful information, invited me out to his house in Palo Alto, and I saw remnants of the Tsukakandl Salon. He had a wonderful Rodin sculpture of Mala you would kill for. Wow. He had some of the uh, artwork she had hanging on the wall. So that's one reason I like the Tsukakandl Salon so much. The other one is his name is Emil Tsukakandl, and his grandfather's name was Emil Tsukakandl. And Emil Tsukakandl, the grandfather, uh, was a close associate of a man called Rokotansky, who's one of the heroes of the book. He was the dean of the University of Vienna Medical School from about, I'm sorry, 1845 to about 1878, and he revolutionized medicine. He put medicine on a scientific basis. Mm -hmm. And he had an enormous impact on all of the people I write about, on Freud, on Schnitzler, and on the three artists, Klim Kokoschka and Schiele. And he did it by pointing out that um, you really don't know anything about a disease state until you've explored it in enormous detail. So if you, particularly in the 1840s, if you examined a patient at the bedside, you would get his history or her history, and you'd listen to their heart and their chest, and you'd hear sounds, but you wouldn't know what was responsible for the sounds. There was no correlation between that and the pathological anatomy. Rokotansky had a privileged position. He was head of pathology, and Vienna was the only hospital in Europe in which every single person who died was autopsied, and the autopsy was done by one person, the head of pathology. So Rokotansky did 30,000 autopsies, not with his own little hands, but with his colleagues. And he collaborated with a great clinician, and so they took the clinical findings at the bedside, the peculiar sounds coming from the heart, and they showed which sounds came from the mitral valve, which came from the tricuspid valve, and if they had any question, they would flow water through the valves and see whether they could simulate the sounds they heard clinically. So they were able to put medicine on a scientific basis through these clinical pathological correlations. And he enunciated a dictum that was really the leitmotif for everything that was to come. He said, truths are hidden from the surface. You have to go deep below the skin in order to understand what's going on. And this is what Freud tried to do. This is what Schnitzler tried to do. This is what Klimt and Kokoschka tried to do. And I argue that these five people independently discovered different aspects of uh, the, the mind, of unconscious mental processes. Now, Freud, you know, clearly was the leader, and he outlined a, a, a coherent theory of mind, which was really quite uh, interesting, original, and fascinating, but he missed certain things. He did not know very much about female sexuality, but Schnitzler and Klimt knew an enormous amount. So Klimt, for example, in his drawings, shows women pleasuring themselves without the need of a man. They can be in their own reveries. The historical nude of Western art uh, usually has a mythological woman, you know, Venus or something like that, looking out at the beholder as if she could only satisfy herself if she satisfies the viewer. Mm -hmm. And she is nude, but she's covering her genitalia. You don't quite know whether this is modesty or whether she's masturbating. With Klimt, there's absolutely no doubt what's going on. Uh, so, And it was done in a elegant, non-pornographic fashion. It's really quite... Mm -hmm marvelous the way these drawings are done. And different aspects of uh, unconscious mental processes were developed by both Klimt and his 
uh, later disciples, Kokoschka and Chile. For example, uh, Klimt knew that if you liberate women's sexuality, uh, you also, in a sense, are liberating their aggression. Uh, and the two can be fused. And he has a wonderful painting of Judith and Holofernes, uh, Judith, a Jewish heroine, trying to save her people from Holofernes, who has established a siege around him, gets him drunk, seduces him, and while he's in his drunken state, she cuts off his head. And there are a number of historical depictions of this. And usually, you know, uh, Judith, who's a, a, a young widow, a very modest woman, did this out of heroism, was horrified by the deed she did. But in, in Klimt's drawing, she's in a post-orgiastic phase. She's fondling the head. She's dressed in a beautiful, elegant gown. There's absolutely not, nothing widowish or modest about her. So, I mean, his ability to really depict many aspects of women's life is fantastic. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> Just fascinating. I mean, we, I'm talking with Eric Endell, author of The Age of Insight, The Quest to Understand the Unconscious in Art, Mind, and Brain. And, in fact, you use Klimt on the cover of your book. Yes, yes. And, 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 and she has a dress that is full of cells. The fabric you, is made you, out of cells, you, right? You picked it up. So Klimt went to the Tukakandl Salon. And from Bertha Zuckerkandl's husband, Emil Zuckerkandl, he became fascinated with biology. He began to read Darwin. There was a collection of Darwin books in his library. Uh, he looked under the microscope. He saw the difference between sperm and eggs. Uh, he went to demonstrations, to dissections, and he incorporates these biological themes into his artwork. Yeah. As you pointed out. All right, we're going to take a uh, take a break and come back and talk lots more with Eric Kandel, author of *The Age of Insight: The Quest to Understand the Unconscious in Art, Mind, and Brain* from Vienna, 1900 to the present. Sight of Dr. Kandel, we've never talked about before. And if you'd like to talk with him, our number one eight hundred ninety nine eight two five five. He is an art collector, an art historian, and as well as being a Nobel Prize winner. And so you. He's a, he's a neuroscientist, but there's a place we'll get into that, too. So stay with us. We'll be right back after this break. This is Science Friday. I'm Ira Flato. We're talking this hour about neuroscience, art, the brain, the subject of the new book, The Age of Insight, The Quest to Understand the Unconscious in Art, Mind, and Brain, with uh, Nobel Prize winner Eric Kandel, senior investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and university professor at Columbia University right here in New York. Our number, one 800 989 Eight two five five. Um, it's hard to imagine the, the collection, you know, of all these people from different walks of life meeting in salons and discussing. Wonderful. Things. Today, it's hard that Wonderful. that that could happen. Is there any place that you know that that? that uh, let me go. To, we have a suggestion on the phone here. Let me go to uh, to Christy in uh, Cedar Ridge, Colorado. Is it? Yeah, it's Cedar Ridge, Colorado. Um, I'm a science writer, and I wanted to say that I think there is something somewhat similar to these salons going on these days. It's happening online, um, on social media and whatnot. Uh, I'm a contributor to a science blog that's called Last Word on Nothing, and we discuss a lot of this sort of... Uh, we lost her. Uh, sorry, sorry, Christine. We just the phone dropped out. But but she, would she be correct that this is where they the new talent? I I'm not sufficiently familiar with that, but I can well understand it. I mean, one of the wonderful things about internet mm -hmm. is it it's like a salon. It brings people together from different uh, intellectual walks of life. Um, also, we're trying to recreate this at Columbia to some degree, and I think other universities will do it. There will be programs that will bridge mm -hmm. neuroscience to other disciplines. Mm -hmm. Did these people all know each other? Yes. They did? Yes. They all knew each other. Uh, and, for example, Freud said he purposely avoided Schnitzler, even though he knew him and he read his work, because he felt that Schnitzler, through his intuition, figured out a lot of the things that Freud discovered only after hard work with patients. Wow. Uh, but he certainly knew him and he knew of him, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, why, why do scientists need to talk to artists? And why do artists need to talk to scientists? Well, scientists certainly need to talk to artists because they want to fill their life with beauty and mm -hmm. it's inspiring to be able to go to a good exhibition and see great works of art, to interact with artists. Uh, and also to try to understand um, the nature of art, how we respond to it, how the creative process works, is one of the great mm -hmm. goals of science. Um, in addition, uh, one would like to think that artists also benefit from what 
neuroscientists can bring about. For example, they certainly learned a great deal when the nature of color was dissected and we realized how colors are put together. They learned a great deal in the Renaissance. Leonardo da Vinci studied the human body, did autopsies in order to see how the bones relate to one another so you can get a more realistic depiction. And one would hope that as people understand what happens in the brain as one responds mm. to art, as one creates art, they would be able to use those ideas to create new art forms or at least to a more effectively influence uh, certain emotional states in the brain. Freud actually wrote about da Vinci. Freud wrote about da Vinci. He wrote about Michelangelo. He wrote two very interesting papers, but they were really more... Uh, fiction than there were fact. He himself said these were not his best works. He tried, to, rather than try to analyze the work of art, he tried to analyze the artist. Right. The artist had been dead for some time, could not free associate to his interpretations and in any way falsify them. And there were some instances in which Freud didn't quite know all the facts right. So these were not great works. What really happened as a Freud contemporary were the art historians got interested in the problem. And a guy called Alois Regal, who was the head of the Vienna School of Medicine, I'm sorry, uh, of art history, um, argued, we have to become more scientific in art history. Um, and he thought that psychology is the discipline that should be incorporated into it. And he thought, what is the problem we want to solve? And then he realized the critical problem in art is how the person who views it responds to it. If you think of it, it's the most obvious thing in the world. Why does the painter do it? He doesn't right. do it just for himself. He wants people to look at it. And Regal pointed out um, that the beholder share is critical to the completion of a work of art. And if you think of it, Ira, you look at a painting. It's two-dimensional. You know that it's two-dimensional. It's a flat surface. And yet your brain is willing to allow your imagination to wander to see it as three-dimensional. So you're being tricked by the artist to think there's a perspective there, to a distance there, even ahead when you look at it, you see it as a three-dimensional thing. And there's a part of you that feels this to be completely real, but there's another part of you that knows this is what your brain is doing. i give you an example. If I paint you while I'm looking at you, mm -hmm. and I put your painting up on the wall, and I walk around it, your eyes will follow me. It's a common experience. I'm sure you've had this when sure. looking at certain works. Sure. Uh, if I put up a sculpture of you in the same position and walk around it, my, your eyes will not follow me. And that is, I create a fiction out of the painting because I have to in order to create Ira Flater looking three-dimensional. And part of that is that the eyes follow you. With a sculpture, it is three-dimensional. No fiction is necessary. Quite fascinating. 1-800-999-8255. Let's go to Steve in Alexandria, Virginia. Hi, Steve. Hi. Hi there. Um, I was intrigued with this when you mentioned Vienna, uh, because some of the best science art that I've seen has been there, and that was at the um, medical museum, from which has a fantastic collection. Fantastic collection. Of these of these wax models, absolutely correct, yes, beautiful from from the 1700s. I uh, believe, absolutely and they, yes. And what's so fascinating about some of them is that they represent the, uh, I guess, very anatomically correct things like the lymph system, et cetera, in uh, life-size images of, of uh, human beings that look like they're in, in absolute agony because the skin has been ripped off of them. Uh, that... and I was wondering, and I, and I, just, I just found that it would be an absolutely spectacular um, uh, use of art and combination with science. And actually, I think it had a very practical value then because mm -hmm. they couldn't quite justify doing all the, uh, the sections of the human body, I think, at that time. I'm not sure. I was wondering if you had any yeah. insight Thanks. in that. Uh, well, uh, Vienna was one of the places in which autopsy was permitted quite early. The church allowed this in Austria. Well, it didn't in many countries of the world. But that museum is world-famous in large part because of its extraordinary collection. And people came from all over to see that. And some of those things were imported, exported to other places. Um, they were just wonderful uh, anatomical demonstrations that students used in order to study the body. Uh, I agree with you. It still is a very fine museum in the history of medicine. Mm -hmm. You have a great, great collection in your book and a gorgeous color in your book also. 
Is there are there places we can see this artwork? Any collections or exhibits that? Uh, but the Neu Gallery, of course, mm-hmm. is in New York the best. Uh, there is in Vienna, there are two museums in Vienna that specialize in this. One is called the Opera Belvedere, and I want to come back to that in a moment. Mm-hmm. And the other is the Leopold Museum. The Opera Belvedere is the upper story, or not the upper story, the upper building of a beautiful property, which has a lower building as well, lower down in the campus. And the campus lower down has a fantastically interesting connection, collection that actually uh, ties in with the upper one. Uh, it has a collection of a sculptor by the name of Messerschmitt. Messerschmitt was a psychotic sculptor uh, in the period of about, I may have this a little bit wrong, about 17 80 to 1790, he made, one doesn't know how many, about 50 to 60 heads, most of them his own, looking in the mirror, of different facial expressions and distortions designed to ward off the evil spirits. They made a fantastic impact. Berta Zuckerkandl had two of them. A number of people collected these, and they had an impact on expressionist painting. Expressionist painting takes images and distorts it. It's sort of a fusion of caricature and high art. Mm -hmm. When you exaggerate something, you know, one responds more dramatically to it, and you see this in the Messerschmitt head. And Kokoschka started off as an Art Nouveau painter, like Klimt, but he did a sculpture called Myself as a Warrior that looks exactly like a Messerschmitt, and I would guess he may have been influenced by Messerschmitt, which was his first expressionist work of art, a powerful exaggeration of his face. Not only that, but uh, Kokoschka began to use, as Van Gogh had pioneered, the use of color in an arbitrary fashion. So not just to depict nature, but to dis- to depict emotion if you wanted to, to make the ears red or the fingers red or something like that. Uh, and it was a, a tremendous transformation. And a, 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 an architect by the name of Lowe's saw this and saw a new art form emerging and told him, this is what you've got to do. Don't do any more Art Nouveau work. Klimt is great. He did it. You do something different. And for the next decade, he did magnificent portraits of other people that had made a tremendous impact in which he really developed his expressionist ideas of trying to see unconscious mental processes in other people. How did you not go into this? I'm the way you, the passion and knowledge. I, I love 50 it. years you've been doing this. I'm glad well, I'm, this, there's nothing like size. <laughs> what uh, was the decision? Did you actually have a crossroad, n- a point in the road you had to decide between the two? Not between those two. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm saying this in retrospect right. that I could do it. But I think at the time I made my decision, I was not as passionately involved in art as I am now. My choice was psychoanalysis versus uh, neuroscience. Mm-hmm. And my God, was that a wise decision. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah for all of yeah. us. Well, I don't know for well, certainly for me. Well, you uh, anything learning? You've been involved with sea slugs for so long. Is there anything new to learn about sea slugs? Unending. I'm now studying how memory is perpetuated. How you remember your first love experience for the rest of your life. You learn that in a sea slug? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> they make love. <laughs> How do they reproduce, right? <laughs> In fact, they're hermaphrodites. They have the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so what are you studying there? Give us there a little is, bit more. About. There is a um, a protein at the synapse that is thrown into activity when you m- remember something for the long term. And the function of that protein is to perpetuate that change indefinitely. And the way that protein works is that it's a self-perpetuating protein. This has been described by Stanley Prusner. It's called prion mechanism. And in Stanley's case, it kills the cell. So when it goes into a self-perpetuating state, it destroys the cell. Many other prion-like mechanisms have been described since then. And they either kill the cell or the, the protein becomes dead. This was the first description of a protein being thrown into the self-perpetuating state in which is the normal fun- it is a normal function of the protein to be like this. It's completely healthy. 
Wow. It's quite interesting. That is different, isn't it? It is very interesting. And how, do, and how does that help with memory or remember what we're doing? What or? it does is it, it, it translates uh, messenger RNAs at the synapse. So when you grow a new synapse, you've got to continue to produce material to keep that synapse alive, that new synapse. And what you do is you have a machinery for local protein synthesis. This regulates that machinery. And if you keep it going indefinitely, which you need, mm -hmm. this is the way you get it done. Wow. I'm Ira Flato. This is Science Friday from NPR. Learning all kinds of new things today. Talking with Eric Kandel, the age of insight, the quest to understand the unconscious in art, mind, and brain. And this it's a gorgeous book. Thank you. It's it, you know it's so filled with. Uh, they allowed you to do it the right way. You know, it's so I talked to authors. They wouldn't let me do this. They wouldn't let me do that. Gorgeous photographs of the brain and 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 the plates and things. Random House did a fantastic job with this. Yeah, yeah. Kate yeah. Medina, my publisher, is just marvelous on this. And and uh, is there a follow up? We're going to have an act two to this, or is this any more art? Any more writing about artwork, or in, in your mind? Not at or? the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's been. A, <laughs> it, uh, I can see the effort. How long it must have taken? It took me a long time to go into. It this actually book. has an interesting beginning. Yeah. Um, this is a digression, if you don't mind. No, that's what we're here um, for. So, uh, in about 1982, I got an honorary degree from the University of Vienna Medical School. And they asked me to give a talk on behalf of the three of us who were getting an honorary degree. And I first thought I was going to relive 38, 39 period when I was treated so terribly. And then I said to myself, don't be Ishmagegi. There's lots of time to express your disappointment. This is, they're honoring you, they're, be gracious. So I thought, what would I do? And um, I thought I would do something in the history of the Vienna School of Medicine, what it contributed. And this is where I discovered Rokotansky. Mm -hmm. um, then on a later occasion, uh, I belonged to a very nice club uh, in New York called the Practitioner's Club. I'm not a practitioner, but I somehow belong, that meets six times a year in the wintertime for dinner. And we take turns giving talks. And I thought I would give it on my passion, Viennese Expressionism. And the talk went over fairly well. And when it was over, I realized there's a connection between my lecture in Vienna and this, and that got me going many years ago. And when I had a break more recently, I decided I would start in on that. Mm -hmm. And you're still doing research with your wife also? I've started recently after 55 years of marriage. We thought we'd put it in the line and we <laughs> collaborate together. Not an easy thing to do, but very, very enjoyable for the two of us. What are you, what are you looking into together? Denise is pioneered the study of how kids get involved in drugs. She's a wonderful epidemiologist, mm -hmm. and she was the first one to point out that kids don't get involved with heroin or cocaine. They start with smoking or drinking, which she called the gateway drugs. Mm -hmm. And so she wanted, after a while, to know, is this just a correlation or is this a causative mechanism? So we explored it together. Um, we used mice and we asked, does it make a difference whether you give nicotine first and then cocaine or cocaine first and then nicotine? So when we gave cocaine first, we found we dramatically enhanced the effect of cocaine. Wow. Give nicotine, brrr, unbelievable. If you give cocaine first, no effect on nicotine. So it's unidirectional. The gateway drug tremendously enhances. And we think that one of the reasons people may get hooked on cocaine is because the needs, once you examine the data, found that most of the people who start cocaine are smoking at that time. And this effect really catches you. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And we figured out how it works in a behavioral sense, physiological sense, gene expression. We really analyzed it. Amir Levine was the guy who led this project in my lab, did a superb job. So nicotine is an entry level to cocaine? Yes. Addiction. Now people are saying there's multiple reasons for giving up nicotine. Nora Volka, for example, has really thought this is a key yeah. finding. She's head of NIDA. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Eric, thank you. Pleasure Good to be luck here. To you. Thank you. Thank you with the uh, true Renaissance man, Eric Kandel, author of The Age of Insight, The Quest to Understand the Unconscious in Art, Mind, and Brain, also senior investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, university professor at Columbia University here in New York.